Good morning. Welcome to another week of Psalms with us here in Morning Meditations. Uh, yesterday, Pastor Peter was here. He kicked us off in our uh, second week of Psalms. There's 150 of them, so if you thought we were going to get away with a single week, uh, think again. Uh, welcome, Fran. Good to see you. Uh, as everyone is logging on, feel free to post a comment, say hello, let us know you're watching. Uh, we, of course, cannot see who is on unless you comment. Uh, so comment, let us know you're here, say hi, uh, and let us know as well, when you were growing up, what did you want to be? Uh, so recently, there, there's been a lot of these parades uh, for kids. Uh, we had one just down our street, I think it was last week, where there were like three police cars, a fire truck, a few like local radio stations cars. Uh, it just reminded me as a kid, like all my friends wanted to be like policemen and firefighters. And so I got to wondering when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? But then I'm also curious, what are you now? Like did, would childhood you be proud of what future you became? Um, so our, our kickoff question of the morning, say hello, let us know you're here. And then let me know as well, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? And are you that today? So for example, uh, when I was a kid, this is like my early, yeah, this is probably one of my earliest memories, and it was second grade, so that doesn't tell me much about what I retained from before then, um, but we had to get up in front of the class, we had to talk about what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I mentioned I wanted to be a superhero, and I wanted to control the power of gravity, so I would essentially be able to fly, because I could adjust gravity around me. I could control other things, make gravity wells to pull other flyers down. I could whip people around by creating gravity fields. My name would be Gravitron. I would have a shaded gray uniform with a G. It was going to be awesome. Uh, and my teacher took me aside, if I remember right, into the hall, actually, to tell me I had unrealistic expectations of what future me could attain to. Uh, so don't do that if you have any second graders in your house. Uh, don't tell them that their dreams are unrealistic, because who knows, maybe they could be a next superhero. Uh, but that's what happened to me, so that's what I wanted to be when I grew up, and now I'm in seminary working towards becoming a pastor. But again, what about you guys? Say hello, let me know. What did you want to be when you were a child, and what did you become? Uh, what what kind of change happened as you got older there? Uh, so Fran, morning. Welcome Jane. Uh, Wickeners, Mark and Sydney. Good morning. Uh, Sorgies, we have Deb McKinney, we got Brad and Mary with us, uh, we have Pat, welcome one and all. Uh, so again, let us know those things, I will check back in a bit. Uh, ooh, Brad is an astronaut, I could see Brad going to space, that'd be pretty great to have an astronaut in our midst. Um, we're going to be in Psalm 51 today, uh, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to, to Psalm 51. Uh, but similar to last week, where before I dig into the Psalm, I wanted to know kind of what What's going on? What led David to write these words, to write this psalm? So before we get into Psalm 51, we're going to look at a bit of the background. Uh, so this is actually a psalm that David wrote of confession after he had sinned against God and man, uh, and then he is confronted by the prophet Nathan, and then essentially David just breaks down, and this is a psalm of confession to God. Uh, so I'll jump in there. Let me see what else we got here. Uh, Mike Rungi wanted to be a professional baseball player. Uh, too long to tell. Well, someday, I hope to hear it. Uh, but so Psalm 51, uh, just a bit of a background information. So David was king of Israel. He went out on his balcony essentially one day and he's kind of looking around at his kingdom. And he spotted a lady and he was like, she's cute. Bring her to me. So his servants went out, they found her, they brought her to him. Uh, he ended up having an affair with her. And then to uh, cover his tracks, he had her husband brought back from war. Uh, when her husband did not stay at their house, he had his, um, her, he had her husband put on the front lines so that he would die. Once he had died, David being the good man he is, consolidated the widow and brought her in as his new wife. Like... A very shady, soap opera-esque story, right? Like, man cheats with girl, girl gets pregnant, man tries to manipulate husband, husband has stature, man has husband killed at war, man marries widow. Like, 
pretty shady, right? Like th this sounds like a B movie story, but it's real life. It's what David did. Um, and David didn't seem to have like an understanding of what he had done was wrong. Uh, and so God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David and tell David, hey, man, you messed up. Uh, what you did was not right in the eyes of man. It was not right in the eyes of God. But the way Nathan did this was with the parable. Before we get to the parable, let's see what else people wanted to be. Uh, Fran wanted to own a ranch and rescue horses. That would be cool. Uh, now you're doing lots of random stuff with technology and communications, trying to be obedient and the spirits nudges. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, growing up, I always wanted a horse. I never got one. Something about living inside of the city, I guess. Uh, Deb wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, Katie Schmidt, good morning, wanted to be a teacher. And in your early 40s, you finally became one. So there we go. We got a first person living up to their childhood expectations. Uh, that is awesome. Uh, and Brad's degree is in astronomical aeronautical engineering. So who knows? There's still a chance David could, sorry, uh, Brad could become an astronaut. That'd be pretty cool. Um, Good morning, Zach. To be a fighter pilot, uh, I I always wanted to be a fighter pilot as well. Um, I even like knew my planes. It's like my favorite, if I remember, it was the F fifteen. I don't know why I liked the F fifteen more than the F sixteen. I think it had a cooler tagline or something. Um, uh, semi retired zookeeper. <laughs> That's pretty great. Um, but so Nathan, when Nathan confronts Bathsheba, or sorry, when Nathan confronts David about Bathsheba. Uh, he comes in and he tells David a parable. Uh, so he doesn't just come outright and say, Hey, David, what you did is wrong. Repent before God and man. Uh, now, granted, like that's how I think a lot of us confront people, especially when someone has sinned against us. We tend to go and be like, Hey, you." we do one of two things. We either say, Hey, you messed up. You need to apologize to me right now. Or we say, Hey, uh, I'm just going to ignore it maybe eventually they'll come too and like that just gets buried and it festers and it just it never is handled well uh but what nathan does he illustrates what i think is a great way to rebuke someone he shares an illustration which leads david to realize his own error so nathan tells david the story of a rich man now, this rich man has plenty of land plenty of agriculture plenty of crop plenty of animals uh, most importantly this man has a lot of sheep uh, he has a large herd of, of sheep that are great. And then there's a poor man. And this poor man has a single sheep. And as it's kind of explaining how the poor man treats his sheep, it made me think of a puppy. Uh, now, this could be one of two reasons. Reason one, it explains how he cared for it. He took it into his home. Uh, he shared a bed with it. He fed it. He watered it. Uh, also, I'm getting a puppy Saturday, so I'm just thinking a lot about puppies, I guess. Uh, but this man treated his lamb as if it was like a puppy. Uh, he cared for it. It was a member of the family. But then a visitor comes into town, and the visitor is staying with the rich man. And the rich man is like, you know what? We need a feast. And what better than slow pit roasted barbecue lamb for a feast? Uh, so he looks at his herds. He sees all of his sheep, and he goes, you know what? I know of a better one. So he goes to the poor man's house. And he takes the poor man's lamb, brings it in, has it slaughtered, cooks that for a meal. And as Nathan's telling the story, like, I can just picture David. David was a shepherd, right, before he was king. And he's like, I know how that guy felt. I know how closely attached you can become to lambs. I know how fearful and dangerous uh, lambs can, or uh, wolves and other creatures can be to lambs. But now the wolf in the story is the rich man. The rich man comes in, steals this guy's lamb, has it slaughtered for a feast, and David, understandably, is not happy. David is like, all right, that guy needs to die. He does not deserve to live. What he did is so abominable that his life is forfeit for the sin that he committed against this man. Not even so. He's like, the, the, poor, the rich man has to pay back that lamb fourfold. Like, he is not happy. He is understandably frustrated and angry. Um, and then Nathan, he's kind of like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. You are That is why you are king. You are wise. You know how to handle these situations. Oh, by the way, you are the rich man. How would that, like, you just came up with this amazing punishment. And the guy's like, yeah, and you are the one to be punished. 
Now, here's the problem. You can't repay the poor man because you had the poor man killed. And he goes on and explains, God did X, Y, and Z. God did all these things for you and for your kingdom. And then you did this, this terrible act. Um, that's where we're at. That, that's what happened to David and led David to write Psalm 51. Uh, so we're going to jump into Psalm 51 here. If you have your Bible, turn to it. Um, I study Bible, so it happens to be on my desk. So I'll be reading out of that today. Uh, I believe it's the ESV. Usually at Trinity, we use the Christian Standard. I just happen to have an ESV study Bible that I use for school here. Uh, but before we jump into that, let's see what else you guys said. Uh, midwife or a medical illustrator from Mary. And I believe, Mary, you're, I want to say, a nurse. Is that correct? You're kind of in that medical field still. Uh, let's see, Carolyn Sorge wanted to be involved in the medical field somehow. Nurse paramedic ended up with a career as an optician and a certified EMT for 10 years. I did not know you were a certified EMT for 10 years. That's pretty cool. Uh, King, Yes, this is pretty much uh, the same inspiration uh, that King George and the duck had from Veggie Tales. I love Veggie Tales. Um, my next morning meditation might be, what is the best Veggie Tales? That might be the opening question next time. Uh, so we're going to jump here into Psalm 51. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and read along with me. As I said, I'll be reading from the ESV today. Now we're just going to read the entire Psalm. So Psalm 51. Uh, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach your transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in the right sacrifice and burnt offering and whole burnt offerings. Then, bill, then bulls will be offered on your altar. So this is very much a psalm of confession. Uh, if you grew up in or around the church, uh, halfway through the psalm, the song probably came into your head, created me a clean heart, O Lord my God. Uh, just the idea that that song was written from psalms. Uh, this is the psalm that inspired that, that worship song. And as I was kind of looking and reading and meditating through this psalm this week, my primary thought was how poorly my confessions look compared to David's. Uh, now, I'm of no uh, blindness. I, I don't have any false assumption that my life is any better than David's. Uh, well, I have less power, which means I have less uh, creativity, I guess you could say, uh, for ways to sin. I am no less of a sinner than David was. Uh, I have yet to send someone off to the front lines to be killed. Hopefully I don't do that anytime soon. Uh, but David's heart in this picture is the heart of someone broken by their own sin. Have mercy on me, O God. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me of my iniquity. Cleanse me of my sin. Purge me with hyssop. Hide your face from me. Uh, blot out my, or from my sins. Blot out my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, deliver me from my blood guiltiness, 
Those are 10 different ways that David essentially said, God, forgive me for my sins. Now, growing up, I had this like condition. I don't know where this condition came from. Um, but like every time I would do any kind of sin, I would panic and I would ask forgiveness. And my forgiveness was like, God, I did something wrong. I don't necessarily know what it was, but forgive me. And if I lost my salvation, I'm sorry, please give it back. Like up until I was seven, that's probably like how my confessions looked. A 30 second prayer of a terrified child. Um, and then as I started to read scripture for myself, I realized, oh, God forgets our sin when we confess. God wants that relationship. Uh, God is a relational God. God created us so that we could be in a relationship with him. And yes, that relationship has uh, some, some strings tied to it. We're obedient. We seek to serve him. He is our Lord. We love him. We love our neighbor. We have no other gods before him. Uh, we had this great sermon Sunday that kind of dug into that, like, what are we worshiping? Uh, for far too many, we might be worshiping ourselves. we might be worshiping our career, we might be worshiping our family. Uh, but we, we need to have those below God on the pedestal of, of our praise. Um, but as I look at this, there are a few questions that popped into my mind. Who says, purge me with hyssop. Uh, I'm not a botanist. I had no idea what hyssop was. That led me on a Google spree. Uh, earlier, it ends up, it just happens to be a fl or a, a plant that has leaves that are great for spreading oil. So they would use hyssop branches for a lot of cleansing ceremonies. Um, so he's saying, it's essentially, he's referencing this cleansing ceremony, saying, God, cleanse me of my sin. Uh, he says, I have sinned against you only. And I'm like, whoa, David, slow down. Like, yeah, you sinned against God. You broke God's commandments. Some of the Ten Commandments you coveted. Uh, for one thing, you essentially murdered for another. Like, those are some of the big ones, right? Um, but he's saying that I have sinned against you alone. And I start thinking, but no, David, like, yeah, you sinned against God, but you also sinned against Bathsheba. You sinned against her husband. Um, but I mean, he can't apologize to her husband because he's kind of dead. Uh, he definitely needs to apologize as well, of course, to Bathsheba. Um, but when you consider that sin towards man to God, in view of who you have sinned against, it's similar to where it says you cannot love your father and mother and serve me. So we have to love God so much that the other things we love in comparison appear almost as hate. Uh, and so like since sin against God is so great of an issue, our sin against man pales in comparison. That doesn't mean we don't ask forgiveness from the earthly people we've sinned against, but it means we definitely need to come before God and sin. Uh, I heard a great illustration. I did not coin this illustration, but I can't cite it because I don't remember where I heard it. Um, and I'll use the illustration of Sunday morning. So for quite a while, up until COVID happened, uh, Kaylin, our youth resident, myself and Wayne Worthy, Worthy, we were teaching a class for the junior hires called Deep Discipleship. Uh, fortunately, this never happened. But if you imagine one of the junior hires came up to me while I was teaching and just slapped me across the face. And said, you know what, Brian, I just, I felt like slapping you. It just seemed like the right thing to do. We'd kind of laugh, we'd shrug it off, and I'd be like, you know what, take your seat, I forgive you. I'd probably make a joke and I'd turn my face and be like, turn the other cheek, you want to take a slap at the other one? Like, it would be kind of a silly, humorous, what, whatever happened. But then if you say, okay, so now it's church service. And it's a Sunday during second service and the child goes up mid-sermon and just slaps Peter across the face very different repercussions, right? Um, the parents definitely going to have some words. Uh, there might be a meeting during the week sometime to be like, what led you to this? Um, but let's keep, let's keep raising that up. Now let's say they're in school and it's mid school day. They just get out of their desk, mid lecture, go up to their teacher and slap their teacher across the face. Detention for sure, potentially expulsion or some temporary uh, removal from school. Can't happen now because you're homeschooled. Uh, so let's take that even further. So they're homeschooled now. They come up and they just slap their parent for no reason. Uh, grounded, I would imagine. Uh, extra chores, possibly. Uh, mediocre meals for a while. Like There's going to be an escalated punishment. Uh, now let's say they go up to a police officer and they just slap a police officer. Uh, based on your age, that might get you a fine. Uh, you might get to spend the evening free of charge in the local jail. Uh, keep escalating that. You go and you slap the governor. Definitely some repercussions coming into play. 
Uh, what about if you slap the president? I mean, if you get close enough and then you slap the president, we'll probably never hear from you again. Uh, you're just going to disappear, and who knows what happened. Uh, story would be you got eaten from wolves. Reality, you're in a camp somewhere. Uh, the crime did not change from if they slapped me to Peter to a teacher to a parent to a police officer to a governor to the president. The, the crime was all the same, but the punishment scaled exponentially based on who the crime was committed against. God being the ultimate authority when we sin against God, that ultimate punishment of eternity apart from him is due. Uh, and that requires we come before God in confession. And David just illustrates this amazing psalm of confession, 10 different ways that he requests forgiveness from God. Uh, and one of the other areas that kind of caught me off guard as I was reading this is in Psalm 16, sorry, verses 16 and 17, uh, where David writes, You will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. We are in the period before Christ. Uh, King David actually is the line that will lead to Christ, which is kind of cool. You see this amazing confession after arguably one of the largest sins he's committed, uh, and God forgives him, and Christ ends up coming from this lineage. Uh, but they're still in this sacrificial system. So when you sin, there are still sacrifices you have to perform to be cleansed, to be forgiven. Uh, but David is saying, you will not delight in the sacrifice. I could make that sacrifice, but you won't care. You, do, you don't find joy in that sacrifice. Um, instead, he says the sacrifice you long for, the sacrifices of God, are a broken spirit, a contrite heart. Um, he's realizing that. He says, and then I will go and make the sacrifice. So before we can be in a position where that sacrifice pays the dividends, creates the return on investment that is needed, we ourselves need to be broken. We need to be contrite before God. Um, and I started thinking about that. It made me think of Romans where it says that, you know, we are the sacrifice as we change, as we're obedient. We are the new sacrifice that God redeems, that God takes. Um, our, our lives are at spiritual form of worship. But Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. So Christ died the death we could not die so that we can have true forgiveness uh, and then as we love Christ, we obey him. But David is saying, like, before we get to that point, like, we need to be broken. And so I, I kind of started thinking about my own sin, and I asked the question, does my sin break my heart? Um, this was about two or three years ago. I was in a small group. I was in a small group that used to meet in the church basement back in the day. Um, and we have branched since then. Uh, but one day we were talking about loving our community. I believe we had just studied the story of the Good Samaritan. And people are talking about those in their lives, their family members, their friends, their classmates, their coworkers, and these people that they love and how our heart breaks for them. Um, and uh, I was sharing about someone and an event coming up and like, it, it moved me to like literal tears um, and just, as my heart was breaking for some of these people, these people I love that do not know Christ. And I just, I long for them to find that salvation. But then I started thinking like, does my own sin ever break my heart in that same way? Uh, David refers in the Psalm to God as the Lord of his salvation. So David's recognizing, you know what, God, you've saved my soul, but I have forfeited it. Uh, you, you did your part. I failed my part now forgive me and restore that relationship with me. Um, and, you know, we look at the world and there's so many sins that might break our hearts, you know, like babies being aborted, people being murdered, children being abandoned or going hungry, widows being forgotten. Like all of these are terrible things. But what about my pride? What about when I boast in my abilities? Uh, what about those things I covet? Uh, my neighbor's sports car that drives down the road, and I go, I deserve that car. He worked 40 years, and are, like he, he deserved that car, right? But like in the back of your mind, like that should be my car. I want that car. Um, see, people kind of tease me sometimes because I'll be walking around, and I'll see like a, a Bugatti or something, rarely here, 
Uh, I did see a Maserati, fun fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago in town. Um, but just this idea, like, you see those things and like, I want, I want, I need, I need. Um, like, does my heart break when I covet those things? Um, when I hinder someone else's achievements for the sake of my own achievements? When I mock or insult other people? Does my heart break for those sins? Uh, I feel far too often we turn a blind eye to some of our sins. Uh, the other day, this bookshelf here, we had just moved that upstairs. I was rearranging books on it last night, and there's a book called Respectable Sins by Jerry Bridges. And I'm like, I need to read that again. I uh, just kind of look at what sins am I overlooking in my life that I need to have a Psalm 51-esque repentance, that I need to break down and say, um, God, for, forget my iniquities, uh, forget my sin, cleanse me with hyssop. Blot out my transgression, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit, deliver me from my blood guiltiness. Um, like, like, what sins do I need to repent of? And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to comment with the sins that you're, you're going to be repenting of. Um, but an encouragement, a challenge for you this week or this afternoon is just take some time with God. Set aside, take Psalm 51, read through Psalm 51 a couple times, pray Psalm 51 and one of the hardest things you can pray is, God, reveal my hidden sins to me. Uh, far too often, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, there may be sins or habits or issues that you're struggling with that you don't even know you're struggling with. But say, God, what have I done? Like, send a Nathan to me. Have someone highlight these things. And maybe that's a figurative person. Maybe that's a literal person. But send someone to me uh, to help me see what do I need to confess of? Help my heart break for my sins as well as the sins around me. Um, we don't want to be hypocritical with, with righteousness or holiness. We want to portray righteous and holiness to those around us. Uh, psalm 51 is an amazing psalm of repentance, a psalm that reminds us we need God. He doesn't need us, yet he longs for a relationship with us. That relationship requires we seek forgiveness, that we repent. But we also know that he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us uh, our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Uh, so, so kind of go to God this week in those things um, and just seek that restored relationship. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close us out here in, in a word of prayer. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, feel free to throw them in the comments. I'll keep an eye on the comments while I'm praying. Um, do a quick scan here. It looks like Wendy wanted to be a coroner or a cosmetologist. Very different careers, coroner and cosmetologist. Uh, yeah, very, very two different options. I found that fascinating. I did not know that about you, Wendy. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, but let me pray for us here. I'm going to pray for, for our church, our community, and each other. Uh, but again, if you have any specific prayer requests, feel free to drop those in the comments while I'm praying. Lord, I want to thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have to gather together digitally uh, and to worship you, even when uh, global crises don't let us gather together. I pray, God, for wisdom, for church leadership as we navigate this, as we seek best ways to connect with one another, as we ask how we can best serve one another in these difficult times. I pray for wisdom for governments, uh, both locally but around the world, as we're starting to see different places return to normal, as we're looking at the, the data of different places, seeing a few countries now entering that second cycle, having opened up and, and the R value is rising. I just pray for wisdom uh, for us as a community and saying, what should and shouldn't I do? What freedoms should I embark on? What freedoms should I release for the time being? I pray, God, that as we enter um, the, the summer, uh, the students, as they're wrapping up school, will be able to find uh, good ways to serve those around them and to fulfill their time. I pray for the parents that they'll be able to find a rest as their second job as a teacher uh, is coming to a close. I pray for the teachers as they're preparing for, for preparing and wrapping up with finals, as they're preparing for the fall season. I pray that you just give them wisdom. Same with the schools as they handle opening. I pray, God, for uh, the people in our church community. We know there's been some difficulty there. We know there's been some joy. Um, I just pray that you help us see you in that, Lord. I pray for uh, the noises friend's son, 18, fighting for his life after a car accident, Lord. 
I just pray that you have your hand on them. I pray, Lord, that you're able to, to heal them of any iniquities, uh, however you best see that fit, be that, be that physically or spiritually, Lord. And I pray that this can be a time that they may draw close to you. I pray for our neighbors, God. I've gotten to know my neighbors more because of this crisis than the year I've lived here, God, that you, you created a, a situation where I got to know them. And I just pray, God, that you can help us love them well. And I pray the same for everyone else here. Help us just love those around us, those in our sphere of influence, God. And all these things for your name's sake. Amen. All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we will hopefully be back tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, with three more psalms for you. Uh, and then we will be potentially switching up to a new a new focus next week. Uh, but thanks, thanks so much. I love, I learned so much through these. I learned so much about you guys, uh, clearly. Um, but I, I look forward to seeing you again. You all have a great day.